okay i think uh, yeah we can begin so um i'm sure uh nicole is a familiar face to a few but uh for those uh who don't know nicole i have prepared somewhat of a formal introduction first of all welcome to the ninth dcw conversation hour a monthly open conversation hour by deoband community wikimedia for anyone in the world my name is ashwarya and i'm the host for tonight ladies and gentlemen please join me in welcoming our esteemed speaker for today nicole sad nicole is a dedicated education professional with a global perspective having contributed her expertise in six countries across asia and the middle east her unwavering passion lies in enhancing the quality of education on a global scale with a particular focus on ensuring that innovative solutions reach even the most marginalized children Nicole has built a remarkable career around this fundamental belief. Throughout her journey, Nicole has worn various hats, serving as a teacher, curriculum designer, school administrator, and teacher trainer. Her academic pursuits led her to an MA in international education with a special specialization in international development at at the George Washington University, US. Notably, Nicole earned a prestigious fellowship with UNESCO, further cementing her commit commitment to education. She continued her impactful work for UNESCO in Jordan, assuming the role of associate project officer in the education sector. Here, she played a crucial part in monitoring EU-funded projects aimed at providing quality education opportunities to Syrian refugees, refugees, and vulnerable Jordanian communities. Nicole, as some of you know, formerly led. the education team at wikimedia foundation she established Re reading wikipedia in the classroom program which helped train more than 50 trainers in 30 countries reaching more than 7000 teachers impressive she is the founder of open learning collective where she helps education leaders develop innovative education programs empower teachers with effective tra training and navigate complex education policies Ultimately she envisions a world where the collective knowledge of hum humanity is free and accessible to all. In today's conversation Nicole has planned an interactive session on transformative leadership and open education something that deeply interests me as an educator. I'm really looking forward to Nicole's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Saad as she shares her, her valuable insights with us today. Welcome again Nicole. Wow, you really did a lot of research for that <laughs> introduction. Thank you. I was like re reminded of all of uh, my past lives. <laughs> so really <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. And yeah, welcome everyone. I'm super excited to um be in conversation with you today about transformative leadership. This is a topic I'm really passionate about and um excited that I get to spend uh more time you know building up transformative leadership skills in um in global educators now in my kind of new uh identity after transitioning from um leading the education team at the Wikimedia Foundation so without further ado i think a few new people have joined us so if you want um to participate in the icebreaker you can share three emojis that represent how your state of mind is at the moment how you're feeling uh what's going on for you so you can see some folks have already shared theirs um these are mine <laughs> that i have shared already on this slide um and so now let's let's get into it so um, let's just nicole i uh, i just have another announcement to make before we oh, move sure. any further sorry uh okay uh please please note that this session is being recorded all right thanks thanks nicole please go ahead yeah. oh yeah thank you for um announcing that so it's being recorded if you want to have camera on or camera off up to you um so just just for your information okay okay so now let's get into it uh transformation what does it mean to transform and how is that different from other types of change so i want us to kind of brainstorm this together we're in conversation today this isn't just me presenting at you so if you can think of what does it mean to transform how is that different from just change in general and write down in the chat how you would explain that to a 10 year old um so how would you explain that to someone with 
uh, you know, a comp the comprehension of a, of a fifth grader. And share one or two examples of transformation that you can think of off the top of your head. Um, doesn't have to be a perfect answer, no right or wrong answers here. We're just sharing our thoughts. So if you can go ahead and do that, and maybe um, Aishwarya, I'm gonna call on you to share your thoughts on this topic. What would you, how would you explain transformation to a 10 year old? I, I can't, I mean, it's just, uh, it's it's such a, so I mean, I teach in a university classroom and uh, often when I'm, you know, encountered with these questions with my niece who's six years old, I'm at a total loss. It's easier to communicate with, uh, you know, uh, 18 year olds fresh out of school about these subjects, but you know, <laughs> when it comes to fundamentals, I mean, I, I even I don't know what, what we, you know, uh, really do, but I mean, um, in terms of education, uh, it has always been a central question uh, because, of course, uh, while we teach uh, this, there is this low hanging fruit of, you know, knowledge, knowledge transformation, which is the, you know, the easier goal. Uh, it can be achieved more easily, but the real question of, you know, transformation and that inspiration or, you know, um, that people seek from classrooms. I mean, it's really difficult to, you know, really pin it down to a skill or, you know, something. So, yeah, I mean, these are my just top of my head yeah. thoughts. No, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for also um, sharing, you know, that you don't know, because that's also really important for, you know, all of us to um, to to know that it's OK to have a different understanding or to be at the beginning of a of a journey so thank you for sharing that really appreciate it um when i think of transformation and education i think of you know this the education systems that exist right now have resulted from the transformation of previous ways of teaching and learning right so um there were times when all of the teaching and learning happened at home there were times when teaching and learning um formally happened in you know, more like apprenticeships and um, in, in like religious institutions, for example, in the Middle Ages, the only way to get an education was to become, uh, in Europe, was to become like a monk, for example. And now we have these very systematized um, and, uh, you know, remnants of the Industrial Revolution as our system. And we have this mindset that this is how it has always been and always will be. So I want us to kind of have in mind that um, transformation has happened in education in the past and can happen again. And we can play our part in shaping what that looks like. And also um, something else that comes up for me is we tend to always think of certain types of things as inherently good or inherently positive. But transformation in and of itself is not inherently good. There's also neg negative transformation, right? And um, education in and of itself is not inherently good. Education can be used positively uh, and negatively in, in many cases. So maybe have that in mind as we go forward. And I've seen really some nice um, examples in the chat the transformation of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Yes, I have that also that on the slide because that's kind of like, I think a very universal symbol for transformation because we have this creature that, um, you know, is kind of comes into the world as a creepy crawly that just stays on the ground and inches along. Uh, this is my, my caterpillar. <laughs> and then, you know, through a process of change becomes a creature that can fly, that has wings, um, that goes from, you know, has many colors, completely, totally different thing, but is the same, is the same being. So I think that's a really great example. I love the idea of the sky changing from day to night. We transform our world from light to dark. Um, yeah, the, the egg to the, to the hen, something that turns, turns into something completely different. So it's not just a change, you know, like your wall might be blue and you might paint it green <laughs> so you've changed it but it's still a wall it's still um inherently the same as you just put a coat of paint over it so maybe keep those things in mind as we continue the conversation and um please keep sharing your ideas in the chat just because we're moving on doesn't mean you have to not share if something comes up for you so if something comes up for you please feel free to share it
So I'm going to share with you a couple of ideas and definitions, you know, throughout this conversation. And these are things that I've adopted from and synthesized from, you know, resources that I've been exposed to over the years. And um, so this is a definition. It's not the definition. Um, transform transformational leadership, um, in my view, is a leadership style where leaders work alongside their community to identify needed changes and guide the community through the change by way of authenticity, inspiration, mentorship, collaboration, and value-centered centered work. So transformational leadership isn't just the what, what you're doing, it's also how you do it and with who you do that, um, who, with who you bring about those changes. So that's my definition of transformational leadership. If you have a different definition that you would like to share, please um, feel free to share that in the chat. And I will move to the next slide because I know we're on limited time. So within the global education sector, um, we've been talking about transformation in education for quite some time. There's a lot of huge global challenges when it comes to equity in education. Who has access to education? Is that education of uh, a good enough quality for someone to leave school and join society and be successful? Um, and those are the questions that we've been grappling with as, you know, the community of um, educators and education policymakers. And last year, late last year, there was a summit um, with the UN, all of the different UN agencies participated, individuals, organizations participated, parents, students participated. And out of that summit came some calls to action, came uh, some priorities that had been identified. And UNESCO has identified these four key initiatives that came out of the Transforming Education Summit. And those are, getting every learner climate ready, expanding public digital learning, fast, track, fast tracking gender equality in education, and improving access for crisis affected children and youth. So if we are to transform our education systems, what the summit brought up was that we have to have learning that's centered around um, protecting our planet and using digital tools to ex enhance the learning experience, making sure everyone, um, no matter what gender they are, have access to education and making sure that folks who are increasingly affected by conflict and crisis have access to learning. Um, and so those are the four priorities that emerge out of that summit. So my question for you <laughs> is, I, don't, I think you didn't know that you're going to have to work this hard <laughs> in this conversation, but I hope that uh, you don't mind. Um, so out of these four focus areas, which are you most interested in? And which of these four do you think is the most important for your community? So if you can share your thoughts in the chat, and if maybe one or two people would like to speak up and share uh, what they think, you can go ahead and raise your hand and and. Um, unmute and share your thoughts. If no one volunteers, I might volun tell you. <laughs> um, Abdallah, yeah, go ahead, share your thoughts. Um, thank you very much, Nicole, for sharing. Um, I think what speaks to my situation now or my context of my country right now is expanding public digital learning uh, because right now our government has rolled out uh, the digital agenda for the next 20 years to ensure that there is access to uh, quality digital education for all learners in all areas and what they are doing to that end is trying to expand the reach of internet to remote areas uh, this follows the impact that COVID-19 had on the education system in Uganda and uh, called for action for such initiative. But currently, there are many uh, edtech startups, like in the city that I'm working in right now, that are focused on trying to achieve or to help the government achieve that goal. But still, there is a problem of lack of quality material on the platforms. So there is 
a problem of adoption of the physical learning materials that is already available, like the textbooks and the, and the different pamphlets available. But the problem comes in in adapting them and transforming them into uh, meaningful digital learning materials. So um, to me, this really speaks to me and uh, it's a point of interest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And I have House of Soft. Yeah, soft sorry, it's, it's soft a soft yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, just uh, in my opinion, I would say that perhaps uh, this fast tracking gender uh, equation, equality in education. Uh, as for my community, this is a basic need, in fact, because you know, I think especially uh, women uh, who are Muslims, uh, or, you know, what do you call it? You know, not just the Debundi, but in, in general, the Muslim community. Uh, they have a very little role to play in the family and obviously the education of the generation to come. So that's one of the issue that is being uh, uh, a disparity is because of the disparity in education and the information. So so uh, this needs to be fast tracked as well. And I, at the same time, it needs the proper attention. And, uh, you know, um, it, and at the same time, not just uh, for particularly for my community or for my region, but in general as well this is, this needs a global platform which is obviously one of the points that you are you know uh, you know you're trying to explain this uh, you know, uh, this step as so so this needs a global platform and uh, um, you know uh, especially especially i'd say that uh, other than educating women also the role of educated muslim women in the society back after they're educated uh, that also needs a uh, proper attention yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. It's uh, it's so interesting to hear how different contexts have you know different challenges that are kind of coming up to the surface. We've seen um, some similar um, focus points in the chat. So I see a lot of um, expanding public digital learning. Um, I see a lot of folks um, saying improving access for crisis affected children and youth. Um, so it seems like all of these are kind of resonating and um, and some of you have been able to kind of pinpoint what are the most important ones for your community. So keep that in mind as we continue on. So the next thing I want to share with you is something I'm calling the leadership action framework. And this is something that I've adapted from various other frameworks that um, have been used to identify how an, an action or an initiative or an investment is um, ranking on the scale of not transformative to transformative, let's say. Um, for example, I used to work at UNESCO, and um, when a new project would come up for funding, we would have to you know, draft the project proposal and put it into this um, digital system. And in that system, there were like, a lot of different indicators that you had to select, like, OK, this project is this, this, this. Um, and one of UNESCO's global priorities is gender equality in education. And so there was this you know, field for selecting, is it um, res sensitive, responsive, or transformative? So there was no option for it to be none of those things. So we had to, you know, even if it was a project about like building, I don't know, like um, electrical infrastructure or something, we would have to indicate, it, you know, how that sat on the scale of looking at gender equality. Was it just acknowledging a gendered element? Was it responding to something or was it really transformative? So we would always have to indicate that. And so I, I researched um, some of these, these types of um, indicators and frameworks, and this is one that I've compiled based on that. And so it goes from one end, which is harm, to the opposite end, which is transformation. And so on this end, you have um, harmful actions or discriminatory actions. And that's taking actions that are antagonistic towards the goals of, and values of the community. Then you have blind action or ignorance, taking actions that are not considered one way or another towards the goals and values of the community or towards the necessary changes that need to happen. Then you have understanding, sensitive action, taking actions that recognize the various causes of the challenges and, um, but doesn't directly address them. Um, then you have responsive action. So that's actions that contribute towards the goals and values of the community, but in a way that maintains the status quo. And I'll go into examples after this, um, and then we can discuss a little bit as well. So that's why I'm just reading them off at the moment. And then finally, at the very, very end, we have transformative action. 
And those are actions that contribute towards the goals and values of the community in a way that addresses the root causes face and makes the necessary changes that benefit the collector. So we have harm to transformation and um, we all might have done all of these things. You know, harm doesn't necessarily mean that it's intentional or that we have um, are doing, doing the harm with, you know, um, with, with bad intentions in mind. It could be that, um, you know, we thought something was, was the right thing to do and it, it ended up being harmful to the, the goal and the mission. Um, or we might have prioritized money over people that happens a lot you know there's lots of things that can contribute towards these types of actions and that's what we have to think about as leaders is you know what's influencing our decisions and how are our decisions impacting our communities so let's look at some examples based on gender equality in education so on one end you have um, harm so perhaps in a country there is actually government sanctioned discrimination against girls um, and we have seen this it, it's you know, a reality that, that many girls face that it's dangerous for them to go to school. Um, and, uh, and there's actually policies that prevent them from going to school. So that would be harmful action, um, discriminatory action. Then we have ignorance and that might be no policies at all that help girls attend school. We just pretend like it's not an issue, doesn't matter. Um, understanding, recognizing that girls have more challenges attending school, but not investing in any actions that change that situation. So we just acknowledge it, but we're not doing anything to change it. Then we have response. So this might be encouraging girls to go to school, building schools for girls. And I think if you look at the types of actions that most initiatives take, they're going to fall into this category. They're going to be um, we see a problem, we do something, we see it, we do it. So we're not really thinking deeply about the root causes or trying to address and change those. We're just trying to fix the problem at hand. And sometimes that's the, the necessary thing to do. You know, if it's an emergency and a house is on fire, you're not going to be like, well, let's look at the root causes of why this house is on fire. You're going to run into the house and like get the people out and make sure everybody's okay. And then maybe later you'll go back and you'll you'll be like, okay, let's analyze like what caused the fire, like how can we prevent these in the future? Um, is there an infrastructural thing? Is you know that type of thing? But um, so a responsive action uh, is neutral, right? It's a neutral thing. It's it's you know can be good. It can also be just maintaining a status quo. Um, but then when we get to the very very end of things, so transformative action. That's really actions that are addressing the social, political, and economic factors that, for example, prevent gender equality in education. So if, um, you know, if, for example, we're in a community that's impoverished, that doesn't have enough money for basic needs, and, um, you know, maybe there's no public schools available, school costs money, and the family can afford just to send one child to school, and they're going to send the child that they think is going to most um, effectively help the family to meet their basic needs and maybe that they believe that's the boy in the family for example um, and so in order to address that if we build a school for girls that's not really going to solve the problem of you know uh, unequal access to education we have to actually take a look and see like okay maybe we need to look at how we build up the economy in this community maybe we need to look at cultural factors um, so when we look at transformative leadership that's uh, it's it's deeper it takes more time it takes more resources it takes more collaboration um, and it's not the easiest thing to do so we have to really think about ourselves as leaders and you know how we we go about um, taking those actions like what resources do we need who do we need to work with um, how do how will we deal with backlash <laughs> because change is hard and people don't always like it right those are those are some of the things that go along with that. Okay, so I'm putting you to work again. Um, it's your turn. So consider the leadership actions that you've seen in your community and you know, maybe think back on the priorities that you identified as being really important for your community. Um, and you know, think of, uh, of leaders in your community and what type of actions they've taken and you know, maybe share one or two examples um, in the chat or if you would like, you can speak up and raise your hand.
this is a deep one. So I'm, I'm assuming it's going to take people a couple of minutes to think about it. So maybe while we're waiting, um, Aishwarya, as like co-host, do you want to, or, or actually the host, <laughs> do you want to share some of your, some of your thoughts on, um, you know, like where do you see the actions being taken in your community and, and what type of actions are they? Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, what uh, locally, you know, our government is doing, um, it's the Delhi state government, which is, uh, you know, uh, which controls uh, the education in and around Delhi. What they've done is they've massively invested in infrastructure. So infrastructurally, I mean, uh, they've developed a lot of schools. So previously we would have schools, uh, let's say, you know, uh, in the radius of, let's say, five to 10 kilometers, we'll have two government schools. So one they've done is they've uh, increased the number of schools in, in that same radius. And two, they have upgraded the infrastructure. So now you, you would have, you know, more uh, tech friendly and, uh, you know, digital friendly infrastructure that is uh, making, you know, all of these uh, possibilities of education more amenable. And uh, they're really tapping into, you know, uh, the whole idea of transformative, you know, education and uh, they're pr producing great results. I mean, as far as uh, policy experts go, of course, we don't know what ground reality is, but to an extent, I mean, we can all uh, congratulate the Delhi government. Apart from that, uh, I think. Can I ask a question, question real quick? Yeah, Do you yeah. think that like building the infrastructure in and of itself is a transformative action? What what makes that transformative for you? Um, mo most definitely. I mean, uh, so I mean, what we see basically, I mean, in in our most immediate context with uh, the helps and um, you know, um, you know, your driver, for instance. Uh, their children, I mean, of course, Delhi government had previously initiated this uh, economically economic welfare program where, uh, you know, students who come from economically weaker sections, they they can they have a reservation of, you know, one fourth of the total number of seats. So what what that helped them with was, you know, a seat in a private education, you know, private education institution, so a private school. But um, they were still unaffordable for, you know, those who fall out of, uh, you know, the economically weaker section quota. So, so what it has done in terms of basic transformation is given them an opportunity. So a lot of, you know, movement has been in that way, uh, facilitating that, uh, uh, that movement from home to school. So, you know, a, a lot of them are going to school. I don't know what, what's happening inside those schools, but, uh, the midday meal and you know all of those things are definitely getting students to come to school and of course i mean with development of the infrastructure and giving them access to computers and uh, you know um other other such uh, opportunities has definitely you know brought them to school and i i guess there's also positive impact there yeah thanks for sharing that um I think when it comes to technological infrastructure, we have to really, and it, uh, I'm not saying it's not transformative, but I think we need to be careful uh, on identifying something as transformative um, when it's a technological infrastructure initiative, because a lot of times what happens is they will provide the devices or they'll provide the internet, um, but they won't, develop the people to use those tools so from i tell this story a lot so apologies if anyone has, has heard it but it's something that like really influenced me significantly and um and i it always comes to mind for me but when i was uh first training teachers in malaysia um i i worked with 30 teachers in five different schools and i changed school districts once so i actually worked with like more like twice as many teachers and twice as many schools. Um, but I, I went from a, a rural community in um, Perak, Malaysia to um, 
like urban, I suppose, in Penang. I put urban in quotes because it was still like not super urban. But um, the schools that I worked in in Penang were some of them had like really nice computer labs. And when I first went to train the teachers, I just sat with them and I was like, forget what I'm being told to do. Like, what do you guys want to do? <laughs> uh, and they, the very first, like the very, very first thing that they said, they were like, Nicole, we don't like know how to use the computers in the computer lab. Um, so we want to, you know, learn how to use the computers. And for me, that was really interesting because it actually was not what I was hired to do. I was hired to, um, you know, impact their teaching methodology. But I thought like, you know, if they're going to trust me, I have to do, you know, what they, you know, what they need um, very, like as the very first thing. So I went to the computer lab and it was a very like well decked out computer lab, like good computers, projector, um, you know, screen that went up and down, everything. But the computers had like a layer of dust on the top of them. Um, because, like they didn't know, some of them didn't know like how to turn them on, not because they were digitally illiterate, but because desktops aren't like things people use that much anymore, right? Like even me, if someone put a desktop computer <laughs> in front of me, I might have to look for the on button. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are just using mobile phones and stuff. So um, that was a really interesting thing. And then like the different programs that were on the computer. So when we think about transformation, it's not, that's when we have to get, get to the root causes. Like, okay, we're going to give devices, but do people know how to use devices? Are those devices actually going to absolutely, solve the problems absolutely. that we need to address? Sorry, that was a long-winded story, but um, t it's, it's something that always comes to mind because I, I was just so shocked at the time. Now I'm not shocked by these things anymore, but at the time I was. I see a lot of really great examples in the chat, so I'm just going to read a couple of them. So discrimination action, this is from Munaza. Um, it brought to mind the hijab row in Karnataka where hijabi students were barred from taking their exams because they wore hijabs. Yeah, exactly. That's definitely a discriminatory action. Um, and then um, the gov uh, Abdullah says the government uh, has taken negative actions by taxing internet services. Yeah, that could definitely be considered a harmful action. Um, and yeah, those are a couple of the examples. If you, if something comes to mind for you, please feel free to continue to share in the chat. Um, and then you will also have opportunity to share even after the call today. So I know we're, we're running out of time, so I'll move forward. Um, all right, so just kind of a final, a final thought. Um, in, when we think about impact, transformative leaders, to recap, address the root causes of an issue, and use inspiration, collaboration, and mentorship to lead a community toward change. Transformative actions, whether big or small, should lead to impact that makes a positive difference locally. And now it's really your turn to think about what impact you want to make in your community. How can you develop your transformative leadership skills and be a transformative leader for your community? Especially when we think about the intersection of open movements like the Wikimedia movement, the free knowledge movement, open educational resources, and these big global education goals, uh, and then the challenges that, that we're facing in our local communities. Where's the intersection of those things? And where do I fit? And um, I being you, <laughs> where do you fit uh, in, in making a difference and becoming a transformational leader? So um, if you would like to dive a little bit deeper into that, question um, you can fill out this this questionnaire it will ask these questions they're the same questions that we've addressed throughout this conversation um, the link is here I'll also put it in the chat and um, and if you fill out the questionnaire then I'll share with you um, a one-hour webinar that I'll be doing um, in the next month and you'll have access to that and all you have to do is fill out the questionnaire and just take your answers from the chat and put them in the questionnaire. Um, and the purpose for that is for me and for the organizers to know how well we did and if you took away from this conversation um, any learnings so we can, you know, evaluate ourselves. 
And with that, that's the end of my part. And I know I took longer than I was supposed to. Apologies for that. Um, but I'll pass the floor over to Aishwarya and then I will also share the link to the form in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I think uh, I speak for everyone when I say this, that, you know, I mean, this was one of the best presentations I've, you know, been part of. <laughs> Just by, you know, in terms of like the engagement and um, um, the sheer, you know, um, awareness of, you know, how, how uh, presentations work. I come from a background where, you know, uh, as academics, you know, we are really impervious to <laughs> the real world outside. And we think that, you know, we can, um, we take a lot of time to step down from our, you know, ivory towers and, we believe in haranguing and you know <laughs> speaking from above so uh it was very refreshing you know um the way that you approach this of course i mean uh, our participants have a lot of questions i believe and they would be you know uh they would be very keen to ask you their questions so um the floor is open you know please uh, go ahead with your questions if you have any um just you know just uh unmute yourself and start speaking there's a little query nicole regarding the form akib says that it's uh not accessible yeah, I will check on that. Give me one second. And in the meantime, if anyone else has another question, please feel free. I'm listening. Uh, any any remarks, any observations, you know, uh, anything is welcome at this moment. So I have a small question for you. Can I? Ah, yeah, please, Abda. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So in the last slide that we had, uh, we talked about the impact wherein you say that transformative, transformative actions, whether big or small, should lead to impact, which is locally, right? So if uh, these impacts are local in nature, that means you're solving these problems locally. So um, does that ensure a kind of global solution to these kind of global problems? So in general, one liner would be that will local solutions for these localities would give a global solution or not. Sorry, multitasking. That's a really great question. So when I say locally, and I thought a lot about that too when I was using that word, um, I think you can interpret a local uh, what local means to you. So for example, we're all in communities. We have communities that are geographical. So for example, like I live in a neighborhood and you know, I might I honestly, like I think I don't take enough leadership actions in my neighborhood. I, I tend to be um, more like out in the, in the digital space or like in, in the global space. Um, but if, if those actions are making a difference in terms of transformative change. I should be able to see things changing in my local community at, at some point in time. So for example, if we say, you know, a global transformational priority is public digital learning, am I seeing in the schools in my community that public digital learning is, um, is taking place? Is it, uh, what we're, is, is it what we wanna see as, as leaders in, in trying to bring about this global transformational change? Um, and so I, I, I was thinking about it in terms of, you know, if we say these huge things at the global level, but we're not seeing them within the communities that we're close to, so that might be geographical. It also might be, you know, like you're in the, uh, the, the community of, you know, this, this Wikimedia user group. So within, you know, the folks of this user group, are you seeing these changes take place and, and how can you come together and be a leader within that community to to bring about the changes. So it's not to be taken like super literally. It's for me like a, a linguistic choice to say that 
if we try to take leadership on a large scale, we should see the, the changes also on a small scale. Because a lot of times um, we as, and I'm, I'm saying this because also I think I've fallen prey to this mindset that, um, you know, we need to think big, we need to think global, we need to, you know, kind of be looking at systemic changes. But at the local level, we're not really involved as much. And, um, and I think real transformational changes is, is really involved um, at, at the community level, let's say, at the local level. Um, and that's my opinion. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, I, not like, uh, it's not like a research paper. <laughs> no, no, I'm not uh, you know, uh, disregarding or discarding uh, uh, the notion of local changes. Obviously, that those are important. But I, uh, my question is basically is that if everyone goes for a local change, which is obviously one should go for, uh, so these local changes, and you have some local leaders bringing about local changes for a given topic. For example, you talk, you talk about digital learning or what open education and stuff. So we have local leaders changing locally for, for a certain geographical region, right? So what my question is that uh, the kind of changes we'll have after some n amount of time, right? So that change uh, will might not have a, you know, a, a global standard because you know, every every change locally will be dependent depending upon the social and economic and whatever some m number of parameters which will uh, you know basically uh, govern the change or decide the level of the change. So so uh, in order to ensure a global change with a certain degree or a uh, universal degree, uh, what do you think should be done? Because uh, locally, when is work when someone is working, and obviously uh, uh, those changes m uh, might have some different kinds of opinions. For example. As I talked about uh, women education, obviously there are different kinds of roles that women have in their different regions and different religions, right? So these kind of roles will govern what kind of education they are going, they should be getting, and what exactly impact do they have or can they have in the society? So depending on these kind of impacts, while preserving the social or religious structure, uh, education will be imparted, right? So obviously this means that the education levels will be different for different regions and religions or the section of these, right? So, so different educational levels uh, for different kinds of women in different you know, uh, places on this earth, will that be a kind of, can we then say that it is, um, you know, women education has been achieved, if that is the scenario? Yeah, sorry, there's a lot to digest. So let me try to maybe think about this slowly. Um, I, I think what you're saying is like without, having the trans like the transformation will be kind of like global and then local that we're at risk of the local um you know for example not everyone agrees on what a human right is locally we might think torture is okay but at the global level we've said that it's not so if we think of like okay i might change this in my local community but that hasn't changed like a global standard or the global standard that we see is not being uh, we're not seeing it as a as a change that happens at the local level that's where i think the transformational leadership comes to play because if we're making these changes at the global level but we're not instituting the um, resources and the training and the you know if we're not looking at those root causes and trying to address them at the local level, we're not going to see this policy actually make a difference. And that's where it like comes, it, it's an intersection of those two things. So if we look at within the Wikimedia community, for example, we have the Universal Code of Conduct, which happened kind of like, you know, it's not UN, but it's, it's like a global level thing. It's happened at the institutional level within the movement. Um, and it was, you know, participatory to some extent, the development of that. But are we seeing um, more people join the movement because they feel safe? Are we seeing in our community, are we seeing that that device has allowed people to, um, to edit more because there's less conflict? You know, how, how is that um, change and that, that action, that leadership action, was, which was creating a standard how is that making a difference to my community? Is it not making a difference? If it's not making a difference, then what's my role as a transformational leader? Do I need to go back to the, to the top and say, this is not helping us, what do we do? 
or do I need to do something, you know, within my community to, uh, to show them, okay, we have a universal code of conduct, you know, we need to re we need to enforce this. So, you know, as the, as the leader, you're looking at the root causes of the thing and what actions you can take. And so I'm not trying to tell you what actions to take. I'm trying to like, like show you the process of like what I think is a transformational, the way a transformational leader thinks. It's not just um, see something, do something. It's see something, ask why a lot of times. And then think about what's the thing that you are best in position to do. Um, because we're not all the best person for the job sometimes, right? So um, that's that's another layer of it. Thank you so, for that uh, question. So, Nicole, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think we're running out of time and we have uh, precisely eight minutes left. <laughs> and uh, if we can just, you know, have one more question, perhaps, and um, I think there are some responses on the chat box as well. Uh, Nicole, if you can, I think Afaf, Afaf has a question. Um, Afaf, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, I hope I'm audible. I'm um, in a no low network area, so I just hope that I'm more audible. That's why I was just ty typing the answer. Oh, sorry, the question. <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, and hello, Nicole. Uh, I um, would first apologize because I missed the first part of your presentation. I was really looking forward to this um, presentation and uh, all the more because I am uh, with DCW in collaboration with DCW. I am working on a project that DCW is um, working on, which is leadership and skills infrastructure plan. So while you were explaining all these um, the issues and how it can be transformed, I uh, was thinking at a local level, for example, um, if we just take um, our community uh, or maybe where from where I come, uh, I see that digital literacy is something which most of the people are not aware of. So um, if uh, we are trying to bring that to the, first of all, we need to uh, make other people aware about the issue. And then later on, I am a little confused because we are trying to make a course out of it. So it would be really helpful if you tell us that, for example, we have just chosen the area, uh, but how can we make it into um, something which most of the people are aware of and whereby we should feel that there is some change that has happened because of it. Uh, so that is what I was thinking about. I hope I made some sense. Uh, Maybe if just I can a reminder. ask for clarification. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, we just have uh, very little time, and I think we have another question. So if you can just, you know, quickly, <laughs> it's a request to just, you know, um, I don't okay. know. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the time. Yeah. we can we can catch up um, after because I I think I wasn't too clear on the question, um, and there's a couple more questions, I guess, in the in the chat. Um, I, I see one, how could we adapt the, I think this is, Nikos, are you saying reading Wikipedia in the classroom, the reading Wikipedia program? Yes, uh, I mean to here to learn how I could uh, possibly adapt it here for uh, Wikipedia, how uh, uh, we could possibly uh, train some uh, local community and uh, local people from the community in order to uh, proceed in this, uh, in order to be able to proceed in that uh, activities and uh, hopefully immerse uh, more students and uh, teachers in Wikipedia. Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I'm not at the Wikimedia Foundation anymore. And my understanding is that they have um, divested from, from, from running education work. So I'm not too sure but what you can always do is all of the materials are um, available there on MetaWiki. And there's also um, adaptation guidelines for those that were produced by Basanti, who 
also used to be on the education team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, unfortunately, there's no education team anymore. There's just been a lot of institutional changes and um, and so uh, it's more up to the community to kind of organize themselves. And um, but the resources are still on Wiki and um, you know, the Open Learning Collective is, you know, a separate entity and I would be like very, very happy to support any community um, in looking at their education strategy on um, thinking about how to adapt those resources and what you could do is, um, I'm, I'm also not sure like where the, where the grant strategy is at the moment, but you could include in your, you know, grant proposals, like a budget line for hiring us as, as consultants on your education projects. So that could be one way to go about doing that, but I'm not um, going to say for sure that that's, um, you know, because I'm, I'm not up to date on what the, the grant policies are um, at the Wikimedia Foundation. I've been gone like about Five, five months or so uh, and a lot of things have changed and um you know but i would love to i would love to continue to see reading wikipedia expand be translated be adapted teachers trained because we know that it was a really impactful program um so i think we're at time aishwarya so thanks for hosting i'll pass the floor to you and um Afaf, I'm sorry I wasn't able to address your question right now, but we're connected on LinkedIn. So maybe if you can type it out for me and I'll try to address it um, with you one on one. Absolutely. Um, so Afaf and others, uh, those of you who have questions, uh, pending queries, uh, you can refer to the message that Afi has left on the chat box. Um, you can write to dcw at wikimedia.org for your you know uh, your queries can be sent there and let me just you know uh thank nicole once again for this outstanding presentation thank you for your time nicole it was you know a, a great enriching experience for all of us listening to you and hope we can see you again sometime soon thank yeah, you others i'm uh, so happy to connect with you all. it was it was great thank you and uh, thanks everyone else who've joined. Uh, thanks DCW uh, team and special thanks to Jessica. All right, here we go. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Feel free to connect also. <laughs> it's on at the end. Connect on LinkedIn or wherever. Bye.